The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, I know I'm meeting with two of the teams today, one on Wednesday and one on Friday. So each of those meetings will take about an hour. And uh, we'll be covering you know, both some, some individual feedback on the presentations themselves, um, as well as talking in more depth about how to narrow down your focus. So right now, it feels like you guys have gotten a pretty good understanding of what everybody else says. Um, and now the, the trick is, the, the, the real trick of XPRIZE, is to figure out you know, within all those things that are clearly important to somebody, What's the most important thing that you can change to change the conversation? So if you can only change one parameter, I mean, start yourself there, constrain yourself as, as far as you can. If you could only change one parameter and really demonstrate that in an interesting way, which parameter would it be? Which one's most important to you? Um, and also we're going to start thinking about not what is it that the field tells you is important. You know, th th this, they're self-perpetuating myths within any field, right? So not necessarily what is all the standard literature tells you is important. But what are you starting to gather from your conversations with your, with your advisors, from your readings, from your creative thoughts within your own group? What is it that is, is really a game changer, right? Is it all about cost? Is it all about power? Is it all about energy? What, what's, it, what's it really an interesting conversation in your group? So we're going to go, for, for, for those of you who are extremely left-brained, the next part of the semester is going to be very, very hard. Um, and then we're going to go from being very logical and data-driven to asking you to stand on your heads for a while and think about this problem in a totally different way. And, and I know that that's going to be challenging for some folks. So what, what I'm going to ask you to do today is we're going to start to step out, of that, step out of the logical box just a little bit and start to play a little bit more. Because what we'd like to do is start to figure out what are the creative solutions, what are the interesting solutions to these problems. All right. So today we're talking about engagement strategies. And by engagement strategies, I mean how do we involve everyone who needs to be involved in this X prize? And it's, that's a pretty broad set of people. You know, we, if we start in, and talk about our, our prize economics 101, right? The, we've talked about the Orteg Prize and the Ansari Prize a number of times. And we know that if you look at the amount of money that the prize purse offered and the amount that the winner spent, the, the amount that the total field spent, those numbers you know, don't necessarily line up and, and equal one. Right? And we have a, a nice leverage that we get from prizes. People are spending more than the prize purse, certainly in aggregate, and often, uh, often even just the, the winner spending more than the prize purse is worth. And why does that happen? Why do you spend more than the prize purse is worth? Because you think that you get some benefit over and beyond what the prize is worth. Yeah, so what do you get besides the purse? Um, they're sort of internal utility uh, sort of saying, I really just want to do this. It feels good to win. Yes. Yeah. So what else? Free marketing. Free marketing. What else? Credibility. Credibility. What else? Establishment of an industry. Establishment of an industry and hopefully follow on market benefits if the, if the prize is designed in that way. Yeah, well. Keep your intellectual property. You often keep your intellectual property, certainly in the X prizes you do. Um, you know, one of the big things that, pri that teams value is the PR, free PR, massive amounts. And this is, and sorry, we're talking 5.5 billion media impressions. Um, you know, if you value that on the, the free market, they call it $120 million worth of free press for your team. That's pretty good. Yeah. Name an ad campaign. Let me, let me be a, more, a little more specific. Name an ad campaign that sticks. Anyone? Paul? Apple. Apple. Which one? Skinny guy. The Apple Got PC. Done. Yeah. Got milk. Got milk. What else? Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Big one. What else? Terry Tate office linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> what do these have in common? What do these what do these catchy ad campaigns have in common? Taglines. Taglines. What else? What else? It's for the moment to let it 
Say that again? It stays over the time. Same message. So same message over time. Also, you tell, you tell inside of this. Yeah, so the, the little jingle. Simple and smart. Is there an ad campaign that you can tell me that you really remember that doesn't fit these things? Anyone, is, there, is there an ad campaign that shocked you? Well, I, I definitely call some of the, uh, the viewer advertisements certainly not simple, certainly not smart, but yeah. you, you remember them anyway. Short, fun, and stupid. <laughs> yeah, that will work yeah. Too. Billy May instead of no. Yeah. So what? What is it about Billy May's? Well, it's just sort of like yelling at you for one to five minutes and <coughs> saying, "This is awesome. You have to buy it now, now, now." Yeah, so there's repetitiveness there. There's also emotional content. And, you know, just Billy Mays is very excitable, uh, very excited. My mom used to cry every season when political commercials came on. It didn't matter what candidate it was for, they always made her cry. Right? And she remembers those. They've got a, an emotional heartstring com component. There are commercials that are shocking. There are commercials that, are, um, yeah, that make you laugh. But they all have some sort of emotional connection. Right? Name an ad campaign that got you to do or buy something. Because you saw that ad, you actually did something. Well, there was the, I remember an ad for uh, like World Lights Out Day. OK. Um, and granted, I'm sort of environmentalist myself, but uh, um, I am far too, I know that I had a bunch of P sets due that week. And that, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was like turn off my laptop and <laughs> just sit around in the dark for an hour. But, Amazingly enough, I, I pulled myself to do it anyways. OK, what else? Who else actually did something because of an ad? Oh, like if you see something on sale, mm -hmm. you click on it to check the sale yeah, prices. Yeah, totally. Prepares. What else? Online banner ads, anyone ever clicked on one? Google ads? I could click on Google ads a lot if I'm shopping for something. I find that the, the ads that come up are, are relevant, right? So it has some relevance to it. It has some relevance to the demographic that it's aiming at. It's actually more than 50% of the click. It's not 80. It's three first ones. All right. Paul? Well, I, I just want to say one is that those with the social cost, that, um, and especially ones that right after 9-11. Yep. Roll up so many checks that I have to mm -hmm. slap myself. Not yeah. The uh, Breast Cancer uh, Awareness Month is October. We just got through. I mean, the number of, of pink ribbons I saw was, was incredible. And the amount of money that that ad campaign has raised for that organization is huge. So some of them make you do things. But figuring out what sticks and translates to what, make, what actually makes you take action is not a simple thing. Is there any ad that you've ever seen that got you to successfully change your behavior? There was a, um, at MIT, there was a group called um, SAVE, um, and again, an environmental group, but they had a, a really clever uh, ad campaign that they call it Do It in the Dark, and it was these glow in the dark stickers that you put on the, um, uh, on the light switch, okay. but at the same time, they're also distributing well, and dark condoms and really stupid stuff like that. But it was it was funny. It was, it was there you go. Light hearted. They uh, use the um, circular doors instead of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I find that those ad those little stickers should be really effective. They're little nudges, right? Has anyone actually read Nudge? Great great book came out. A uh, top book for the Economist magazine this year. Talks about how, you know, right the messages in the right place at the right time can really change behavior. The way that you, you know, arrange your, the food in a in a middle school cafeteria can choose, really determine what kids choose to eat. You know, little, little, little nudges. Have you ever had an ad that you loved and you couldn't tell me what the product was for? For instance, uh, 
There's a number of ad campaigns out right now for car insurance. There's the one with the, the uh, anime girl. So can anyone tell me which company that's for? Uh, yeah, that's um, progressive. Not progressive. No, no, it's, it's online. It's like insurance. Insurance. Yes. What about the white room with the all the white? Progressive. Ad, when it is progressive. Um, I'm sure there's other. What about the the gecko? Gecko. Gecko. Would you remember it if it didn't say gecko and gecko sounded like the same thing? I don't know if I would. I'm spending so much time paying attention to the gecko. So I think that there's a lot of things that we can think about in terms of advertising. We sort of know intuitively what gets us, um, what misses us, and what is, is catchy and fun, but ultimately never left a mark on, on our, our behavior. This was a, a nice slide that uh, Dr. Parrish Bever put up a couple weeks ago, last week, um, sort of talking about the stages of, of prizes, right? So we have an idea, we do the prize design, we do validation, we talk about the, the, uh, the prize. We kick it off. We do some monitoring. We have our proof of concept, our actual, our actual competition. And then there's a new market that comes. So which of these require uh, advertising? The stuff under prize communication. Okay, so who are you communicating to? The people who are going to compete for the prize. Okay, so prize communication. You're going to comp communicate to potential competitors. If we, if we consider this to be the whole, area, the whole period of time before the prize is launched, who else do we have to communicate to? Who else do we have to sell to? Sponsors. Sponsors. Who's going to put up that $10 million prize purse and all the operating expenses? Who else? Media. Yeah, we, we do. Uh, I would say media is a, a little one in this phase. We're sort of cultivating relationships, but we're not trying to tell a story to the public just yet. Not not until we have a not until we have a, a person hand. But who else are we really looking to talk to at this point? Judges. No, I guess it's too simple. Let me let me broaden that out and say the industry. So in this phase, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're doing your prize design, you're validating it, that's where you know, experts, expert opinions, community opinions really matter. Um, this is where it mattered uh, you know, what the, how, how we measured 100 miles per gallon equivalent. It mattered where the race was going to be. It mattered um, what kinds of vehicles were going to be allowed in the competition, no matter what the safety standards were. And these kind of inputs all came from the the community at large. Not necessarily the people who are going to compete, though some of them were involved. I mean, Bert Rattan was involved in the, in the formation of the rules for the Ansari X Prize. He was, he was someone that they went out and, and asked. So were a lot of his competitors. Um, but this is, this is the stage where we're talking, we're thinking about how do we form the, formulate the prize the right way? Who's going to compete? Who's going to sponsor? Where else does communication come into play? Prize kickoff. I yeah. So the kickoff is big. So the kickoff for Progressive Automotive, they were on stage at the New York Auto Show with Michael Bloomberg. Uh, Jay Leno had them on TV that night. Uh, pretty big media events. So who are you communicating to? I think this is where they first get public at large. Probably. Yeah, it's the public. Who else do we care about at the kickoff? Media. Yeah, media is big. And in, in some respects, because they are an angle to the public and everybody else, um, but in some respects, because you're starting to cultivate a relationship with the media that's going to last throughout your competition. And this is where you really start to engage them. What else? Competitors. Yeah, competitors. Comp if you don't, if the day of the competition, <laughs> the day of the competition is launched, um, no one knows about it, you fail. Right? <coughs> so your competitors. Anybody else? Those are your primary audiences. What about during the prize competition? So your teams have registered. Things are going along. No one's won yet. Are you doing any any uh, message managing? Any media work? Yeah. 
competitors are doing and making sure that it's still interesting. Another thing that's in this phase for XPRIZE is education. Um, we'll say educators and students. So starting to, to do the, and it's part of their public campaign, but also as an explicit uh, additional item. Is it important doing the price uh, formations where you create these check dates so that you can get the attention of the media to continue to say, oh, Yes, like exactly. And now you have only. 500 companies and now down to 100 companies. Yeah, so stage gates are really nice for drawing the attention of the media. You, you, can, you can only send out so many, prize, or so many press releases that say, we're having a competition before people start to ignore them. But if you send out one that says, now we have 20 competitors, now those 20 competitors are going to be you know, putting their cars on dynamos. Now we have you know, 10 competitors, including this really interesting story from West Philly High School. Yeah, you can start, to, you can start to, to build your messaging. In that way, but, but also the different trials or stages you make, like what is happening with mm -hmm. the, uh, the lunar X Prize, with all those you know trials of the rockets going on. Yeah, exactly. So the, the w if we have the uh, let's call it the the prize competition itself. So now you're you're launching your rockets or you're racing your cars or wh whatever's going on. Anyone different this time? Probably you look at like the investors involved now, not so much the sponsors, but people who might take this idea. Yes. So the, the future future investors. And that's some of that's happening up here as well, right? I mean during the prize, most of the teams are still raising capital. The, the, throughout the course of the prize. I mean, there's 21 teams in the, in the Google Lunar X Prize, and I don't believe any of them have enough money to launch a rocket right now. So they're, they're still raising money. So here you've got future investors in the technology. You definitely want you know, the, the big automakers to be at the, at the, the race the day of, of Progressive Auto. Who else? Anything? Anyone disagree with me copying this list up here? Out during the prize so, so from the perspective of the X Prize Foundation, a prize is not just about the new technology, it's also about ex inspiring the next generation. Okay. And insofar as educators play a formal role in that. The other thing that happens the day of your prize competition is that you're starting to look for future sponsors. And th this is where this is where all the excitement's happening, right? If you if you have the uh, progressive auto X race, X prize race, and you don't you don't have you know the next set of sponsors lined up and, and watching that race and getting excited, you've, you've done something wrong. So future donors, future sponsors, surprises. What about afterwards? Is there anything to be done after a prize is won? Yes. What? Continue trumpeting the winner as look at this spectacular thing we've done, and also. From this, we've created these new products. Uh, and the point is to change things, you need to have one prize go out and never hear about it ever again. So, post prize, you're building the team, building up the team, and not even necessarily just the winner. Uh, there may be reasons to be telling stories of the, those who competed and failed, or competed and got close. Um, you're trying to build your brand, and insofar as your brand is tied up with these teams, that's a part of the reason for supporting the teams. Um, but you're also trying to support the industry. Because ultimately, success of Burt Rattan in selling Spaceship One, success of uh, Virgin Galactic in launching people into space comes back and benefits the XPRIZE, right? All right, so you can tell that there's a lot of PR work that goes on throughout the course of a prize. In fact, it's, uh, if, if I were going to name the X Prize's core competency, I would say it was PR and marketing. Um, that's, that's fundamentally what the organization is, is sort of organized to do. We're going to talk about four uh, pieces of an engagement strategy today, namely audience, uh, which we started to talk about a bit here, the message strategy and the delivery. 
Who's this? iPod, iPod and, and Bono. So there's two things going on there, right? You can all tell me who it is. Why is that important? Yeah, but why else is it important? I mean, this isn't. I mean, some of the iPod videos are very generic, you know, people. But this one, this one, we all know is Bono. Why does that matter? That's the same reason why everyone puts uh, stars in their ads because everyone wants to be like Mike. <laughs> so there's there's a, a demographic that you're shooting to to capture here. You're uh, affiliating the X Prize, uh, the X Prize name, the Apple name, with you two, right? And you're saying that that affiliation is is somehow meaningful. So we're going to come back to that. There's um, some of what we were talking about over on that list that's, that's happening here. These are really simple ads. I mean, there's, they're not uh, graphically intensive, right? They're not um, heavy on the, the messaging. It's, it's typically a, a song or an image like this. And we still know that it's iPod. Why? Because they've put out so many of these and it's the same style. Yeah. So that, that stylistic branding and the, the building, building a, a, a message or a, not even necessarily a, you know, a tagline, but a, a, a visual tagline over time is really impactful. So let's, let's talk about audiences. We, we said over here that we said, wanted to talk to the public. Right? So let's talk about a, a, a prize in, in energy. Who is the public? Because you can't talk to everyone. You can't talk to six billion people on the planet all at once. So if you're gonna if you're gonna be talking about energy, you know, are any of these people particularly relevant? Are there other audiences? Are. Environmentalists clearly are. Techies can be. Techies can be. Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs. Who else? I remember a um, uh, a, a demographic that they used in Better Place was they called scuppies. Socially, uh, socially conscious young urban professionals. Socially conscious yuppies, all right. Scuppies, I like it. <laughs> Who else? Who else is relevant in the energy prize? Well, in some cases, it would also be the developmental crowd, right, for mm -hmm. the third world prize. What if you're trying to reach out to the people that are going to be taking advantage of, of your global prize? Yeah. What's your demographic there? NGOs. Governments and geos. Is there any reason that you'd want to reach out to the users? We can't. Uh, it's very hard to reach out. It's, it's, it's doable, though. It, it's harder, but it's doable. But I'm not sure they can influence. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. but, but also, it has the risk of the promise. It does have the risk of a promise, right? So re reaching out and engaging the end users for a product that doesn't yet exist is building a market which can be valuable, and it, it can be dangerous as well. So, Who else? Are there, are there other segments of the, let's say, the sort of Western media savvy market that are relevant to, a, to an energy price? Well, it's, it's going to be whoever is going to be using it at the end. So green aviation, the aviation the hobbyist market will be interested in this. And mm -hmm. Home scale storage, the people who are in the markets that have um, time of day pricing will be interested. And grid scale storage, it's going to be more utilities rather than so much like the public as we tend to think of the public. So there's clearly the user communities. What I want to push a little bit today is to remember that the broader community is actually really important for XPRIZE. Right, we talk about 5.5 billion media impressions. Those don't go to only the competitors and the users. Right? The, in the, particularly in the case of commercial spaceflight, we have a total user market of, uh, estimated around 13,000. Right? You, you far oversampled if you're trying to push out 6 billion media impressions. But that's important, right? You're building a name for the prize. You're building an audience. Uh, competition is, is worth far less without people watching, watching the competition. Right? Imagine uh, you know, a scrimmage football game versus an, an NFL game on, on game day. Really big difference in terms of the amount of dollars you can bring in for ads, in terms of the, the sponsors that you can engage. So if we're going to think about energy, is there a, another demographic that we need to make sure we engage? People who think technology is cool and they need. Yeah, just the neato. How would you find them? 
What's what's a salient feature of those people? Disposable income. So they have some level of disposable income. Yeah. What they read. Yeah, like what? A popular science, popular mechanics, yep. wired. 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 Yeah, wired. Yeah. So popular print magazines that are technology related. Google. TV shows? Yeah, like um, the Fix Up Your Home shows would probably be a reasonable place to look. Mm -hmm. um, Discovery Channel kinds of things. Big Bang Theory. Myth Mythbusters. Mythbusters, yeah. So is there another way that you find those people? Are there things that they own? Are there places that they shop? So Tools, uh, electronic, like anything where it's any sort of do-it-yourself stuff. <coughs> Probably uh, newer media displays like Pandora, for instance, mm -hmm. or Group Shark, or something like that. So, insofar as you're reaching out to the the people that tend to be the early adopters, I think that that's that's very true, um, and you you can sort of start to think about how early you want in the marketplace you want to be reaching out to. Um, you know, we have that that nice bell bell chart, right? So you know that your your early adopters are the most passionate. And they're really useful to, to tap into. But they're also a very small chunk of your market. So if you're talking about going viral, they may or may not be the, the right people. Okay. So what about teams? And we're going to talk to teams. Given, given with the current technology, though, I might disagree with you a little Yeah, bit. please. For example, like Francois, the Twitter man, mm -hmm. if you, with those guys, they can have a long, it's a long tail. So That's true. It's, it's, it's huge. I, I don't with with the right Twitter users, right? It, like Twitter, like Wikipedia. There's a very small fraction that control a very large audience. Right? So if you can get to the if you can get to the gatekeepers, then you have a, a pretty broad distribution. The, the average Twitter user, the average Facebook user, is, is a fairly small distribution. So which causing? I think it's it behooves us mm -hmm. to find out who are, who are that person to try to get definitely our prize across. Yep. If you're going to engage teams, yeah. Can I just have another question. So, can you tap into nationalistic uh, things? For totally. That? So, who, would, who, what kind of people would you target for that sort of thing? Well, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like for our, for our prize, like I'm not quite sure who you would tap into. So, people people get engaged in energy for reasons of pure environmentalism, right? The, the sort of we call them the tree huggers, right? You also get the a, a couple of different nationalistic uh, angles on it in the U.S. You get the uh, dependence on foreign oil, right? So there's a there's a definite market there, and that's somewhat segmented by politics, and but not exclusively. Uh, you can also tap into that group by thinking uh, um, sort of about the made in America pride. Um, which was a, a much bigger, a much stronger movement in the, in the late 80s, early 90s than it is now, but there's, there's still some things going on there. Um, and we can also realize that we're not only reaching out to uh, American audiences and American competitors, right? It may, be, it may behoove us to, to really tap into and, and call on the nationalistic tendencies in Japan or Israel or Romania or you know, wherever the, the markets are evolving. Yeah, Francois. I think you can also try to advocate People who are powerful in the community. Mm -hmm. Like Bob was here last week talking about Antarctica. Mm -hmm. If you can get this guy on board some of your events, because people will try to get news from those very particular personalities in markets. Yep. And they, if they get involved, you've got to sort of rebound on it. Right, definitely. Definitely. So let's talk about teams in particular. So we, we've talked about the segmenting the public. How do we find the people who are going to compete? So there, there's obviously the people that are already in your industry. They're pretty easy to reach out to through trade publications and industry conferences, and you sort of you sort of know who's in that space. If you want to bring someone into a space, how do you do that? You have to figure out. Well, there's one the shotgun approach where you just try and reach the largest number of people. Like you go on Leno, sure, and you. Uh, advertise your automotive prize. But how, how do you find relevant? Like general technology publications like Technology Review or... Like yeah, so you can, you can reach out to the general technology community. How do you find... What do you think of as adjacent markets to energy? Energy storage in particular. What are things that people may be working on that's not storage but could be storage if they thought about it differently? What was that? 
muddy and not in chemical. Yeah, chemical, right? What else? Electrical engineering sorts of things. Electrical engineering. Laptops you're probably familiar with energy storage. Mm -hmm. Small scale electronics. Small scale electronics. Um, Bob Metcalf was talking about the the role of sort of interconnectivity and the internet in bringing together smart grids. And so if we, if we think that IT has a, a role to play in, in our technology, that, that might be an interesting community to bring in. What else? Architects. Architects. If you're going home scale, if you're going uh, larger scale, maybe civil engineers? Well, maybe the, maybe the, I mean, the, the teams should be the one who should make dream kind of. I mean, mm -hmm. the question is, who can, who can, sorry, who can we make, I mean, what the guys will be dreaming since to all the price. So it might be a different angle than, than only the techni technological side. It might be some mavericks, say, okay, I want to change the world. I want That's right. I don't care what my prize is, I want Dean Kamen competing for it. Yeah. Right, or I don't care what my prize is, I want Who's another name out there that you would want to just get in uh, on your, your action? Team Ransom. Team. Richard Branson. Who else? Oh, the, uh, college team from MIT. Yeah, college team from MIT. Who else? Emory Lovins. Emory Lovins. Right. So there, there's, you, can, you can already, I mean, without even going to, to Google, you can come up with four or six names off the top of your head. Add those to the ones that you're already expecting from the industry. Um, broaden your, your thought about you know, a few more university labs, a few more um, hobbyist teams, and you've actually got a pretty wide field. Okay, so these are our audiences. Next thing is the message. We were talking over there about taglines. A short, concise message is really, really important for a prize. And we're going to talk about this from a few different, different perspectives. But when I, when I talk about messages, Ansari is the first private space flight. Right? Uh, the genome is sequenced 100 human genomes in 10 days. Progressive, I'm talking about uh, you know, a race of cars that are getting 100 miles to the gallon or better. Right? You're able to capture it in a really succinct phrase. And most people, you say, you know, cars getting 100 miles per gallon in a race, that, that's enough to sort of grab their attention. And then you can tell them a more in-depth story. Right? It helps to have a sticky image or tagline, it, you know, to have this image of a race or to have something that's, that's technologically interesting. Um, energy is tougher, right? Uh, figuring out, you know, saying I want a battery with, with X power density doesn't stick and it doesn't capture what people already intuitively understand. So thinking about how you tell that story. And not only what you want them to know, but what you want them to do. Um, is your tagline about them becoming involved? This is a, uh, you know, all teams can play. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, or is it that you want them to donate money? Is it that you want them to tell their kids? Is it that you want them to tell their neighbors? So thinking about how you build that message. For prizes, we can think of this in a few different parts. One is we can talk about the rationale. All right? Why was the Ansari X Prize there? Well, sort of at the, the peak, it was because Peter wants to see the day when, when humanity is left to Earth as its only uh, place of existence. All right? But it's hard to tell that story, right? That's a big story to tell. And there's a personal reason he had, which is to get, get himself and his friends closer to traveling to space. And that was, that was meaningful. And he told that story personally a lot. Um, and then this is a, a quote from a newspaper article that came out at the time. To open a new era where space is no longer the exclusive domain of massive governments, space programs, and ordinary people can now realistically dream of one day reaching for the stars. I mean, it's a nice, it feels good. It's not a concise message but it feels good, right? So figuring out, are you telling the story of the rationale? Or are you telling the story of the challenge? So you know, we have, we've, we've talked a lot about where on the, the, the scale of, of difficulty do you place your challenge? Um, you know, are we talking about affordable and available access to space, uh, wide scale commercialization of, of the space frontier? We weren't giving a prize for that. We weren't giving a prize, a prize for orbital spaceflight. We were giving a prize for suborbital spaceflight because we thought it opened up these other markets. Right? So you can start to talk about the challenge that you're offering. And you can start to talk about the prize. And this is, this is the messaging you guys are going to be building over the next few weeks. Um, and sorry, was the, and sorry you, know, you can say X prize for commercial spaceflight. People talk about it, the SpaceX prize. 
um, you can say it was for the first private space flight, right? You can tell someone that it was for the first private team to go to space twice in two weeks. You can say it was for the first team and you, you know, cite all the, the variables and numbers that were relevant. You can hand them the master team agreement, which was the 60-page contract that teams signed when they came into play, right? So depending on who you're talking to, it will depend on how much they want to know about what your prize really is. So as you're starting to craft your prize, you're going to want to think about, you know, what, what's the name of it, first of all? I mean, that, that's actually going to go a long way in your, in your marketing. Um, what is the, you know, if you can capture in three to five words, what's the challenge? It's the first private space flight. It's a race for green cars. It's, it's sequencing my genome. It's, you know, how do you, how do you put that in a really tight phrase that's meaningful? And then how do you build that out to, to tell more about what the competition actually entails? So, you know, is, it, is the re relevant thing that it's a private team in space twice in two weeks? Is it that it carries uh, three passengers? You know, it's, it's some subset of the, the full rule set that, that starts to deliver your message in a, in a meaningful way. Okay, so we talked about the, the strategies here, um, the different elements of the prize that we're going to try to, try to build a media uh, communication strategy around. Um, for XPRIZE, launch is sort of the, the big first thing. So we talked about the, the launch at the, for, for the Progressive Auto XPRIZE at the New York Auto Show. Uh, for the Ansari XPRIZE, it was standing under the arch at, at St. Louis uh, with the head of the FAA, the head of NASA, 12 astronauts on stage, uh, launching with the new Spirit of St. Louis, which is mimicking the Spirit of St. Louis that uh, Charles Lindbergh was sponsored by. Uh, sustaining interest, you know, building that media story. The only thing when, when XPRIZE signs contracts with the team, the only thing that they maintain rights to, none of the IP. You have your own technology. But XPRIZE gets the rights to all the media attention, right? They get the rights to tell the story. They get the right to tell you how big the XPRIZE logo is going to be on your jacket when you're racing your car. You know, they, they get to tell all, the, they get to manage all the PR. So that's got to be, um, you know, thinking about how they're going to use that and, and build, build the interest up to the day of the competition. Obviously, the, the competitions themselves are, can be massive media events, particularly if you have a date certain prize. A little bit harder when, you're, when you have a first past the post prize. And then uh, building on success. You know, here we have Spaceship One hanging in the National Air and Space Museum. This is the most frequented museum uh, in the world. And, and Spaceship One is hanging in the main lobby, right? So th that was a piece of the PR strategies that were, were built up for Ansari. Delivery. How you deliver your message is just as important as what you're saying, right? We can think of uh, ad campaigns that are very guerrilla. So I don't know if any of you were around in Boston when the, uh, the little Cartoon Network guys went up around, yeah. right? <laughs> Closed down the city. I mean, these were little, for those who weren't around, they were little light brights, little children's toys that had um, the outline of a, a new Cartoon Network character on them, and they were placed all around the city. People thought they were bombs. There was a, a major bomb scare. The, the police came in. It had news coverage for hours and hours. Uh, roads were closed. It ended up being extremely effective marketing, <laughs> but at a cost. Right? So the guerrilla campaigns can be really great, and viral campaigns can be really great. The question is, do you want to do it that way, or do you want to have the mayor of Boston at your side saying, we're having a race in our city? Right? Which, which one is more useful to you? So you'll have to think about what's the strategy. Who do you want to involve? Who do you want to engage? Who do you want to alienate? Because you may want to alienate people. That may actually be of use to you. You may say, you know, all those existing utilities, Forget about them. They're, they're, they're dinosaurs. We have nothing useful from them. Or you may want them in your back pocket. Right? And those are two really different ways of crafting your communication strategies. The medium that you're using. Um, are you out there communicating on, on blogs and Twitter and Facebook? Or are you on the evening news? Average age of, evening, of broadcast evening news watchers in the US is like 64 years old. And so. <laughs> Uh, a quick question about guerrilla versus mainstream. Mm -hmm. Could you, is it possible to do both? It is possible to do both, but it's harder, right? I mean, it depends on what your message is that you're delivering in your guerrilla yeah, tactics, right? Okay. Yeah, so the, you know, the we're fighting the we're fighting the proliferation of AIDS by dumping body bags on the on the stairs of the UN was actually intended to engage the UN, uh, but by engaging the public's you know ire and doing that. 
So there, there are ways to do that. Um, I mean, for instance, they, they can't be mutually exclusive, such that like the gorillas one, like or the gorilla message could be, you know, uh, screw the utilities and take your home off grid. Whereas mainstream message would be like benefit the utilities and, and help them reduce. I think you'd growth. find that that was difficult to engage <laughs> with audiences okay. like that. Yeah. Maybe if you're running through the CIA. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, which medium you choose will det you know, be based on who your audience is, who are you trying to reach, how are you trying to reach them, how do you want to come across, do you want to come across as, as young and fresh, do you want to come across as established and credible? You know, not that you can't do some of both, but again, the, the medium that you use will, will drive some of that. Um, the location. Are you delivering this uh, at the largest energy trade show, at the, at the IEEE conference? at um, you know, the uh, Menlo Park where Edison had his first light bulb. Uh, you know, there, there's very different images and, and emotions that are evoked by using different, different locations. What are other locations that are relative to energy? Power plants. Hoover Dam. Power plants, Hoover Dam. What else? Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. Independence Hall. Independence Hall. Little Poor Villages. Little Poor Villages. Anything else that comes to mind immediately? A coal mine. A coal mine, yeah. Benjamin Franklin's lab. Yeah. Las Vegas Strip. So places where energy is used, places where energy is produced. Landmines, if you're talking about batteries. There's lots of different ways, and they all evoke very different mental images. Antarctica. Antarctica. You mean landfills, huh? Sorry, landfills. Yes, not landmines. <laughs> Two totally different things. Um, dates. If I say, what's a date that's relevant to energy? You pick New York City had a blackout. Yeah. Anniversary of a blackout. If you want to pull up the nationalist uh, no foreign oil angle, then do it on July the 4th. Independence Day. I sort of disagree, I mean, not disagree, but there is bias in that, which is sort of America centric. Yeah. It, it, it's, so it's, a, it's a choice. It, it's very much a choice. And you wouldn't want to launch on July 4th if that wasn't your intention, right? Bastille Day. <laughs> right? Yeah, Bastille Day, yeah. That's more than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little surprise. You do so the choice of date it, is not arbitrary, right? Do you want to do this in, in the middle of the Olympics? Do you want to do it in the... Uh, during the, the holiday season? Do you want to do it when you're likely to get a lot of news, when you're not likely to get a lot of news? Just choosing when you launch something actually has a lot of pl uh, play into both who you're reaching and how you're going to reach them. Um, choice of a spokesperson. We sort of talked about that with, with Bono uh, and you two. Um, what no, don't, you don't have to give me any names, but what are the sort of categories of spokespeople that we might think about? So, what was that? Alcohol. So politicians, has been politicians. <laughs> Nobelists. Yeah. So you, you, could, you could pick an environmentalist, you could pick a politician, you could pick a, a, a very public figure. We've talked about you know, picking celebrities, so movie stars, TV stars, rock stars. Descendants of technology heroes. Mm -hmm. Descendants of technology heroes, so Eric Lindbergh involved with the the launch of the Ansari X Prize. Might be able to pick up living technology heroes. Living technology heroes. What are other groups that might be interesting to have on stage with you? But if you do those, I mean, the challenge is the mass audience do not know who they are. Yep. And that's why guys like Al Gore, he's not a, he's a former politician. Mm -hmm. and he's not just a pitch man. But even Al Gore is polarizing, right? So the, your choice of your choice of a politicized spokesperson is, is very much going to drive your, your audience as well. And that, that may be in line with the people that you're trying to reach. It's something you'll want to ask. Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson unfortunately. Uh, Alas. Anyone else that, that comes to mind? A rural villager. A rural villager. If you're trying to reach uh, you know, emerging economies, a cricket player, a soccer player, and yeah, there are there are, are big public figures in, in every culture, and yeah. knowing who those are and who you're trying to re reach. Yeah. Uh, exactly, gimmicks. Uh, we had one one team last year that wanted to uh, light the White House green. 
so it became the greenhouse. Uh, there have been you know, groups that have draped the Hollywood sign in black in mourning. There have been, you know, what else? I mean, you guys, you guys know more ad gimmicks than I do. What are, what are other big things that have happened? Things that you noticed? What are they, the equivalent of MIT hacks on the world stage. Cartoon Network. Cartoon Network. It's actually pulled off a few MIT hacks. There's been lots of body bag campaigns for various causes. What else? Hmm? Artificial blackouts. Real blackouts. <laughs> what's, the, what's the pluses and minuses of doing a gimmick? And pluses, you get a lot of media attention, right? What are the minuses? You get a lot of media attention. You get a lot of media attention. <laughs> what are the other minuses? Might get thrown in jail. Might get thrown in jail. Might get negative publicity. What else? People might not know what you're. Might miss the message entirely. Yeah. yeah. What else? It can only. It, yeah. Well, we already said it could backfire. You mm -hmm. may lose some sense of legitimacy. You may lose some sense of legitimacy. So, again, gimmicks may go better with guerrilla ad campaigns. Not necessarily, but possibly. Um, in in terms of trying to come across as, as edgy and not um, established. Yeah, there was an ad campaign in Canada for the Nissan Cube where they said this is going to be all Web 2.0, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of backfired when um, they noticed that several of the winners had some form of personal relationship to the judges. And yep, so you have to be careful about what you're claiming and how, how credible you are if you are going to put yourself out on the stage like that. Um, the other thing is that these things can be really expensive. And just, just in terms of cost, cost can be really big. Uh, depending on how you do them. And so deciding, is it more worthwhile to you know, pay, all the, pay all the expenses to turn every, uh, you know, turn, black out every building in, in downtown New York, or to have a, a massive ad campaign through an ad agency? And you know, everything you're, you're choosing. And I, I think this is sort of the, the core message about today's lecture is we want to reach the whole world, right? We want to reach all the public that's relevant. We want to reach all the competitors that are relevant. We want to do it in a way that's exciting and engaging. And you can only do so much. So when you pitch your uh, final X Prize to the, to the board members, you're going to have to say, you know, these are sort of the three most important audiences and three most important messages. And here's how I'm going to reach them. Right. You, it's not, I'm going to reach the world. It's, I'm going to reach, if it, if it is, I'm going to reach the world, it's going to be very shallow because you know, a given dollar only spreads so thin. So you want to be able to be targeted with your message and figure out who's most important to you and in what way. Paul? No, I was going to say in terms of the, the gimmick, another way that very uh, good PR is the, the Chicago um, Irish Parade. Mm -hmm. They, they literally dye the whole river. Dye the river green for St. Patty's Day. Yeah. So is that a gimmick? Yeah, it's totally a gimmick. But can you piggyback on an existing? Sure, as long as you can control the messaging. If everyone thinks that you're celebrating St. Patrick's Day instead of green energy, clean energy, that might be a, a backfired message. Okay, so what I'd like you guys to do is get in your teams, and we're going to take the next, let's say about the next uh, 13 minutes, we'll take till 3.40. And what I want you to do is to come up with an XPRIZE marketing campaign for a green battery prize. So this is a prize, we'll say it's $25 million for a replacement for, um, for toxic batteries. You know, this, we're going to create batteries that can go be thrown in landfills, no, no evil effects. All right. So I want you to think about who your audience is, your most important audience, or audiences one or two. Uh, who, what you're going to try to be saying is your message, what's your strategy, what's your delivery. So what I'd like to do is sort of go around the room and talk about each of these things step by step. Uh, so I'm going to go, we're going to take a one, one group and we'll sort of run it all the way through on, on one message. And we'll, we'll take some more and see where we land. Uh, so Francois, let's start with your group. Uh, what's your audience that you decided to target? Well, there are two origins, like... Let's, let's pick one. Mm -hmm. One to start with. We'll oh, come back. Uh, All right. And what are you trying to tell them? Um, that whoever works well, that we build this prize to... Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
reduce pollution while still providing yeah, battery services. Okay, so we talked about what you want them to know and what you want them to do. So you're telling them that the prize exists. And do you want them to do anything about it? Just be excited? Yeah, just be excited. Okay. Well, I'm not and supporting and Okay. What was your strategy for engaging the environmentalists? So, yeah, okay, so one, one big kickoff followed by like a regular traditional meeting. Okay. okay, and in your in your big kickoff, how are you going to deliver that? Uh, there will be a green energizer for me. Green Energizer Bunny Tour. Okay, so you've chosen the Energizer Bunny as your spokesman. And what is what is he doing on his tour? He's touring the city, jumping, changing batteries, not collecting them. Beating his drum. Beating his drum. Okay. Do you have any other any of our other you know any city in particular, any date in particular? Did not matter at all. A lot of cities. Worldwide launch. Well, we do not quite build it that way, but no. I think you understand better now that you sort of take the groups, because we have several groups, and so mm -hmm. we work for a vertical mm -hmm. instead of horizontal. Okay. What do you guys have? Who's your, who's your first audience? Uh, like large, um, like the bike Large device manufacturers. Okay, what are you going to do to? What do you want them to know or do? Well, kind of to realize the actual environmental cost of that is they actually use. And what do you hope they do if they once they know that environmental cost? Uh, more of so that you to get them to start with environmental friendly. Do you want them to buy your new batteries? Or do you want them to, to change other things? Do, do you care? Uh, okay. Did you have a particular piece of the strategy you were focusing on? We were going to do a long term gorilla smear campaign. Long gorilla smear campaign. Plus launch of new batteries. All right. Shh. Is there anything else sort of salient, big features of your long gorilla smear campaign? We were going to distribute Energizer Death Bunnies. <laughs> Energizer Death Bunnies. All right. And what is an Energizer Death Bunny? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, entertains your death bunnies. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right, Paul, <laughs> what's your group focus on? Uh, we, <laughs> I don't know, I don't think that we did it this way, but uh, let me try. We were um, focused on the consumers. Okay. Three hundred, especially with mommy with the baby. Low on mommy with the baby. And how are you going to, or what, what did you want to tell them? That uh, don't pollute the planet. Don't pollute, buy new batteries. All right. And how are you going to do that? What was your strategy? Uh, we were trying to place ads and things like uh, not the uh, newborn baby magazine or the popular Parenting magazines and popular science magazines. Okay. I think that you're. But, but, well, I read popular science magazines while I was pregnant and with young kids. I don't think your your demographic overlap is probably very large there. But well, the, your parenting will. Parenting will. Some of those. And yeah. then the popular magazine, science magazine, is more on, you know, for the well off. 
Social conscious. Yeah, so, you, so exactly. So when, when we broaden that, that definition of audience, for sure. Right. Okay. What's your delivery strategy? Um, we were saying that baby playing on the pile of batteries. <laughs> baby on batteries. And I it on, the, on the Earth Day. You're going to announce it on Earth Day. All right. So you're going to have a big print ad campaign announced on Earth Day. And your image was a baby crawling around on batteries. Yeah. All right, so you're drawing on the mother's heartstrings. Don't poison my baby. Always works. It's true. <laughs> it, it almost always works. OK. Similarly, we were also, so we, we talked a bit about um, how to get the competitors involved. But then we also uh, were interested in focusing on consumers. And for consumers, basically, we were thinking, um, Kids, parents, environmentalists, and um, and miscellaneous other that we can do you think we'll probably be able to pick up as well. Okay. And what was your message to them? Um, the, I mean, the basic message is that you know we're coming up with these new green batteries, and we should switch to them because the current batteries are super bad for the environment. Okay. Strategy. Uh, our strategy is we're going to have Captain Planet be our spokesman uh, and sort of hit up probably, we were, we were thinking maybe uh, some sort of rollout campaign probably at, uh, at the Superfund site uh, and then sort of follow that up with um, as probably online and, uh, and in traditional media too. Maybe after school special. Yes. So we're, we're probably, to some extent, we're going to, to some extent, target children, and then the children will go to their parents and be like, oh my god, you know, why are we doing these bad things? It's a long standing ad technique. It's uh, completely so, reasonable. Uh, so, Captain funded a super fun site. Yes. All right. Did anyone have a, a strategy for engaging competitors? <laughs> uh, okay. There's a couple of obvious groups that would get involved, um, and it was probably fairly, it's easier to reach those people, so, you know, put advertisements in the Chronicle of Higher Education um, saying, we've got this prize, we want competitors, what are your ideas um, to, to win it all? And uh, universities are an obvious place to work. Um, and sort of chemical engineers, electrical engineers. Uh, so sort of put up their trade magazines and uh, websites that they're most likely to visit. Yeah, put ads on Facebook for everyone who's a chemi or electrical engineer major. Okay. Anyone else think about engaging competitors at all? Let's, uh, let's be totally ridiculous. If you're going to be totally ridiculous with this. I like the Energizer Death Bunnies. <laughs> <It's laughs> Captain, Plan Captain Planet's great. He's not ridiculous. <laughs> I don't think you've seen those cartoons. <laughs> oh, I have. I assure you I have. We actually reviewed them last year as part of our PR campaign. Um, is there anything else that would be like, you know, let, let's say you wanted to go totally rogue. You, you, you want nothing to do with the current battery manufacturers. You're looking for something totally different. You could give out, um, if, depending on how green these batteries are, you could give them out as like the random passer buyers as like, uh, like candy or a snack. <laughs> or <something. laughs> battery <laughs> candy. Yeah. Drinking battery acid. Battery smoothie or something like that, and then like dip, dip two electrodes in and still battery you know, power supply or something. Drinking like, the electrolytes. Oh, electrolytes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Get Gatorade on it. Gatorade. I like it. I like it. Powerade. Powerade. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> Powerade. You could also have a concert. Powerade. A I D. Get Willie Nelson and Bono. <laughs> <laughs> Willie and Bono. 
what if we wanted to be very conservative? What if our, our goal was to impact Energizer and Duracell and the biggest manufacturers in the world and we really wanted them on our side? We really wanted them engaged. How does that change your ad campaign? I guess we'd have to sort of demonstrate that what you have is literally no different than what's already out there, just it's already better. Yeah, so there's, there's a, a degree to which your, your demonstration becomes critical, right? The demo, demo equals credibility. What else changes? Uh, well, you want to bring them on board and have them involved. So maybe if you can work out ahead of time with them that uh, if the batteries you know, meet this level, that they will produce them. So we talked about a little bit at the beginning of class about advanced market commitments, advanced purchase commitments. Engaging a ma major manufacturer in one of these could be a really great way to, to really set some credibility. So we're going to make sure that you know, they're going to make the first million units and sell them. What about, um, is, there, is there something other than the manu battery manufacturers that grants you credibility? Are there partners besides ma battery manufacturers? Yeah, like Energy Star. Yeah. Kind of so something like Energy Star ratings. Is there some sort of when, uh, Greenpeace. Greenpeace. Yeah, yeah Greenpeace is um, definitely a two-edged sword. <laughs> Um, it, it comes across as being both green and um, crazy. and crazy, so and, and not so peaceful. <laughs> yeah, I think is, is a fair way of putting it. But it, it definitely polarizes. You go more regulatory route and say like these toxic batteries are going to be outlawed in ten years. Yeah, so you, you can get a you can try to get a regulatory reform passed. That's um, it, it's an interesting strategy. So when X Prize flew the Ansari flights. The FAA pushed through you know, an incredible set of legislation that allowed that to happen in the U.S. in very short time. Um, if you wanted to have a regulatory piece to your, your prize, when would you want to do that in, in the sort of course of the prize? As early as possible. Yeah. So ideally, when you would launch the prize and you would have, you know, it's your choice of, of uh, a bipartisan set of senators and, and, and representatives on stage with you saying, we're passing this bill or we're, we're putting forward this bill. Um, if you can do it early enough, then you can really impact who's going to compete. Although, if you do that, then doesn't it kind of negate the purpose of the prize? Because you're the Senate or Congress is then creating the incentive for you. It, it, it depends on. You can you can use it as an extra piece of your incentive, right? It's it's if you think that they're likely to do it anyway, then you're, you're right. You're stepping out in front of the parade with a, a prize purse you don't need. Um, if you think that your prize is what's allowing them to, to sponsor the legislation, give them the confidence to sponsor that legislation, there may be some argument there. It's, it's a fair question. Okay, so as you move forward, you guys are going to be narrowing down your, your focus. We need to remember that the conversation isn't just about batteries, right? It isn't just about storage devices, but it's about the people around the technology. And I mean, we, we didn't talk a lot about that today. It sort of came out in some of your delivery messages here. So, you know, it's about the kids and the and the pollution, right? It's about the parents and their kids. It's about um, the someone was saying we want your ideas. It's about the sort of the personal pride of being a competitor. At some at some point, the actual technology itself is completely minimized behind what's happening um, in your public relations stage because we're making heroes out of the teams. We're making messages uh, that are related to you and me personally. And we're drawing on that emotional connection that we talked about for ad campaigns. And you don't have emotional connections to batteries in most cases. Right? So as you start to think about how you're going to craft your prize, have these things in mind. You want to make something that's exciting, that's engaging, that's uh, meaningful to a, an individual level. All right. If you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be meeting with Team Grid Storage, I think, next. Or you guys next. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, Wednesday, we'll be meeting at IDO or at this, the Kendall's Tea Station.